Welcome to the Electricity of Life, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. On this channel, we have explored some of the greatest technological feats in human history. Scientific exploration continues to provide unprecedented data, allowing new insights into the most perplexing cosmic phenomena in remote regions of space. But in the 21st century, for human beings on planet Earth, what may be the ultimate mystery of human life remains unresolved. That is, how and why does consciousness exist? The unanswered question is characterized as, quote, the hard problem which is essentially the mystery of why any physical state is experienced consciously. Of course, the neurosciences have provided extraordinary understandings of the human brain and its relationship to conscious experience. But is this physical matter and its complex electrochemical processes the generator of consciousness? This is the question author Mark Gober explores in his book, An End to Upside Down Thinking, dispelling the myth that the brain produces consciousness and the implications for everyday life. In part one of this two-part presentation, Mark begins laying the foundations for the evidence that consciousness is more than the brain. My name is Mark Gober. I'm the author of a, of a book that came out in October called An End to Upside Down Thinking. And the subtitle is Dispelling the Myth that the Brain Produces Consciousness and the Implications for Everyday Life. Now, typically, when I talk to people about the, the subject of my book, I'm asked if I'm a professional scientist or a philosopher, and people are often surprised to hear that I'm actually neither a scientist nor a philosopher. My background on a day-to-day -day basis is in business. I'm a partner at a firm called Sherpa Technology Group in Silicon Valley. We advise uh, technology and innovative companies on their business strategy and on their intellectual property. Prior to Sherpa, I worked in investment banking with UBS in New York, actually during the financial crisis. So my first day of work was in July of 2008, and I, I was there until 2010. So I saw a lot of the activity that was going on in New York, up close and personal at one of the large investment banks, which was a fascinating experience, which could probably be its own discussion. But uh, prior to UBS, I was a student at Princeton University, where I was captain of the tennis team, and my major was in uh, psychology with a focus on behavioral economics. So my background has traditionally been, like I said, in business and athletics, and I touched on psychology and economics in college, but I really wasn't looking at consciousness and existence per se. I had thought about majoring in astrophysics in college because I had some big questions about the universe, and it's a very strong department there. But because of my commitments on the tennis team, I, couldn't have, I didn't have time to study astrophysics. So I think the interests have always been there. But it wasn't until about two years ago that I really became interested in the topics that I discuss in my book. And it was kind of a random process. I was listening to podcasts and I was listening to the first one was a health podcast. And a woman came on who talked about energy healing and speaking with deceased forms of consciousness, like dead people who still have a consciousness and psychic abilities and things that I had just never even heard of. Like I hadn't heard of a human being speak about these things in a serious way. And it, it didn't it didn't change my world or anything, but I remembered at the end of at the end of that interview, the woman whose name is Laura Powers, she said she has her own podcast called Healing Powers, in which she interviews other people who have had very similar experiences. And I was looking for new podcasts to listen to because I drive from San Francisco down to uh, the peninsula, and there's it can be a long drive with traffic. So I just put her podcast on, and after a few weeks of listening to her interview people who had had similar experiences with consciousness and what people might call the paranormal in certain circles, I became interested because it was a lot of people who were independently describing very similar things about the nature of reality. And I had never heard about these things really spoken about in this way before. So I was wondering if the people were just somehow delusional or if they were all lying, but I, I couldn't really reason that they were colluding behind the scenes because they were from di very different backgrounds in many cases. So it, it, it got me curious enough to say, why don't I just start reading books about this and look at, into this further? And the more I researched, the more I found that there was actually legitimate science in, in these areas. And I became hooked on it. And I, and I found research from the US government, from Princeton University, from the University of Virginia, and from many other places. And I realized that something was there. And over the course of a few weeks initially, I realized that my old worldview needed to shift. And we can discuss what that worldview was in a minute. Uh, but 
I ended up researching for a year, long story short, just for my own personal benefit. I wasn't looking to write a book. I wasn't looking to speak about these topics explicitly. I just wanted to understand reality because I think reality, whatever the nature of reality is, will inform how we act in society and how we find meaning in life. So I was just trying to understand it for myself. In the process of that research, as I became more comfortable speaking about the topics, I started to tell friends about what I was learning. And to my surprise, people were actually very interested in the topics. And these are people with very mainstream backgrounds in business or athletics or kind of a similar background to mine. And they were saying that it was very interesting to them. And some people even told me that their lives were shifting as a result of the conversations we had. So the combination of my personal passions for this topic and the responses I was getting, I, I said, well, why don't I just try to put it on paper? And this was July 2017. Fourth of July weekend was a four-day weekend. And I decided to just stay in my apartment in San Francisco for four days and basically do what I used to do in investment banking, which is work around the clock. And I ended up writing more than half the book that is now out that weekend. And I finished the whole book over the next few weekends in July. So I went from no plans of writing a book to coming out of July 2017 with the book that is now out. So I mentioned that my worldview shifted. And I should explain what my old worldview was, because this is the worldview that science is implicitly teaching through our education system. And I think for many people in, in modern Western society kind of subscribe to this general perspective, whether they would articulate it this way or not. But my old worldview has a, a name in science and philosophy. It's called materialism. And materialism says basically the following about existence. There was a Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago that started the universe. And that event filled the universe with physical stuff, material that we call matter. So my table that I can touch, it's made of atoms of matter. So this big universe had matter all over the place. And in a big enough universe, you're bound to end up with matter interacting with other pieces of matter. We call that chemistry. So now we have chemistry in this universe. With enough random chemical reactions, chance tells us that we're bound to end up with a molecule that can replicate itself like DNA. So now we have DNA, which leads to biology, like a human being, which then develops a brain, and from the brain comes out consciousness. And by consciousness, I mean our inner subjective experience of being alive. So when I say I am speaking right now, that I is what I mean by consciousness. It's not a physical thing, but it's my sense of identity. Materialism says that matter, as I just described, leads to or creates consciousness through a brain. Matter creates consciousness, i.e. the brain creates consciousness. That's the worldview that's promoted by much of science today. And when I used to look at that worldview, because I understood it very well, if our brain produces our consciousness, then what happens when our brain dies? What happens when our body dies? That means the consciousness that we have is gone. That means our memories are gone. Our emotions are gone. So if something happens to on a day-to-day -day basis that we consider to be good or bad, in the end, does it actually matter? These were the questions that I would ask myself. And what I concluded is that there is no meaning under the materialist view because once one is dead, there are no memories and no feelings anymore. So while, while we can try to come up with meaning during life, to me, it was just a rationalization because of the ultimate reality that consciousness is a product of our material body. What I didn't realize in my, in my studies in academia and, and elsewhere and just thinking about life is that there are some real scientific questions around this notion of materialism. And many of them center around the very last step, that the brain produces consciousness. Now, why do we think that the brain produces consciousness in the first place? And I think there are some good reasons to start there. One is our sensory organs are located in our head on our head. So like our eyes, our ears, our nose, our mouth, much of what we're sensing is up there near our brain. So it feels like our consciousness is up there. And I think that biases us in a certain way. If we played a thought experiment for a minute and imagine that our eyes were at our shins, where might we imagine that our consciousness resides? You know, that's an open question. We might think about things differently. But our sensory organs are located near our brain. So I think we're biased in that direction. But there are probably even better scientific reasons to think that the brain produces consciousness. And it comes from what we know in neuroscience, which is that there is a strong, strong correlation between the way our brain is acting and the consciousness that we experience. 
So for example, if um, a person gets in a car accident and damages her brain, then she might have memory loss or she might have other cognitive impairments. And we can say, look, there was a change in the brain and their consciousness changed. Another example, let's say we, there's a study where someone stimulates a part of the brain that's the part of the brain that's responsible for vision, for example. That person might have a change in their vision as a result of stimulating the part of the brain that is known to be responsible for vision. So again, we change the brain, we change consciousness. What's the issue? Can't we just say that the brain produces consciousness? Now, there, there's a potential logical error in that line of thinking, which is to say that because two things are related, one must be causing the other. It's not necessarily the case that one is causing the other when two things are related. There's an example that I love from Dr. Bernardo Castrup, who says, imagine that you have a fire and firefighters show up. You have a larger fire, more firefighters show up. So we have a very strong correlation between the size of the fire and the number of the firefighters that are showing up at the scene. Now, do we conclude that the firefighters caused the fire? No, we don't. But we know that there's a strong relationship between the two things. Now, let's bring this back to the brain and consciousness. There's a strong correlation between the brain and conscious states. Could there be another explanation other than to say that the brain produces consciousness that would still explain this correlation? And there is an alternative possibility, which is to view the brain as being like an antenna receiver. That's a very general metaphor. A more precise metaphor might be to call the brain to be like a filtering mechanism or a processor of a consciousness that is not produced by the body in the first place. Now, this is getting to the notion of the title of my book, An End to Upside Down Thinking. What I regard to be upside down thinking is the idea that matter creates consciousness. What if we flip it and consciousness is actually primary? Consciousness is more fundamental than matter. This might explain some of the issues that science is having. It's known as the hard problem of consciousness. What Science Magazine has called the number two question that remains in all of science. How is it that our physical body, like I can touch my arm, I can touch my leg, I can't touch my consciousness, I can't touch my mind. How does our physical body produce a non-physical consciousness? Science doesn't know the answer beyond knowing that there's a correlation between the brain and consciousness. What if we're just thinking about things in an upside down fashion. What if consciousness doesn't come from the brain and instead the brain is an experience within consciousness? That's the upside down thinking that I'm referring to. And the majority of my book, An End to Upside Down Thinking, is the scientific evidence to suggest that that is true. So what is some of the scientific evidence that points in this direction? One area is known as quantum physics or quantum mechanics, which doesn't prove this idea, but it certainly points in that direction. And the, it's been around for about 100 years, over 100 years, and it's led very famous people like Max Planck, who won the Nobel Prize. In 1931, he said, quote, I regard consciousness as fundamental, and I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. So he was looking at this new physics of what's happening at the ultra small dimensions and was thinking that consciousness is playing a role and might even be more fundamental than physical matter. There's a study known as uh, the, well, it's known as the double slit laser experiment, but the effect that is shown in that study, it's known as the observer effect. And to give a very brief description here, the observer effect shows when an observer is observing the experiment the behavior of a physical particle changes just by virtue of somebody observing. And this has baffled physicists because, wait, why should a particle change its behavior when someone's just looking at something? Shouldn't it just always behave the same way whether or not somebody's looking at it? This has, has really brought questions about whether consciousness is playing a role in physics. And there are big debates about this. Dr. Dean Radin at the Institute of Noetic Sciences has recently run some incredible studies on this in which he explicitly tested whether people, when they put their mental attention to the experiment, can affect the behavior of the particle. And what he finds is that using statistics, there is an effect when people put their mental attention to this experiment. Now, many more replications will be needed, but it could be a revolution in physics to understand this phenomenon that has been very mind-boggling to many physicists for a long time. My overarching point here, again, is that quantum physics, which is a proven area of science, 
is at least pointing in this general direction and has made some very smart people think that consciousness might be a fundamental aspect of the universe rather than a product of matter. In part two of this interview, Mark will explore the growing body of scientific evidence that consciousness is not generated by nor confined to the brain. And he will explore perhaps the most meaningful question facing human beings. What is the ultimate fate of one's consciousness after the death of the body?